we've been talking about universal law, and we established that these so-called laws of nature or laws of science are the things that make order in the universe. There can be no order of any kind unless there's a consistency, and consistency has been labeled universal law, laws of nature, the laws of science, the laws of physics, call them whatever you want. There could be no such thing as science were there not universal laws, eternal truths, absolutes upon which you can depend 100% of the time. We established that they are absolutely immutable not subject to change at all, totally without solicitude for nice people or the environment or the good of any individual. They cannot be set aside. Universal laws are so solid they cannot even be broken by universal intelligence. If universal intelligence could set aside universal law, then it wouldn't be a law. For it to be dependable, it must be absolute. All right, now one of the laws that we started to talk about, if you remember last week we talked uh, at some length about the law of cause and effect. And we said that if you recognize the law of cause and effect, recognize that there's no such thing as an effect without a cause, it enables you to plan your life. Most people plan things backwards. They do things and then hope the result will turn out right. Management by planning goes the other way. You first decide what kind of a result you want, and then you set into motion the causes calculated to make that happen. Now, of course, you can't always foresee all of the consequences of any act. Sometimes we'll make mistakes, we have to backtrack and set other causes in motion. But at least we can plan our lives, plan our community, plan our universe by setting into motion only those causes which we have intelligent reason to believe will result in the effects that we're hoping to see. It makes absolutely no sense at all to go through life doing things and then you go home and hope, you pray to the good fairy that you've done the right thing. <laughs> Let's think in advance. Hey, if you are planning to educate chiropractors, now we've all had something to say about this, everybody who's ever been a chiropractic student, has complained about the education. Okay, now the shoe's on the other foot. You're running a chiropractic college. What kind of a program would you put in? Now, wait a minute. Before you start telling me your program, first think in your own mind, what kind of a chiropractor are you trying to graduate? What qualities would you like in your graduates? Only when you have decided that does it make sense to put in the various courses that will accomplish that end? Now, if you did that, maybe you'd change your chiropractic college. Maybe you wouldn't. But in either case, it makes no sense to throw in the courses first and then hope the graduates turn out right and then spend the next 20 years regretting the fact that they all turned out wrong. If they turn out wrong, something is making that happen. Bad luck, maybe. No, no such thing as bad luck. Cause and effect. If chiropractic is to be improved, if your practice is to be improved, if your personal life is to be improved, there are certain actions calculated to make that happen. There are certain actions calculated to prevent that from happening. And there are other actions where we really don't know what the end result will be anyway. It's not that there won't be an end result, but we just can't foresee it. Once you understand that law of cause and effect, you can plan your life a whole lot better rather than just let things happen to you and then bemoan your losses at the end of the day, the week, the month, or the year. Remember, when you've planted corn, your crop is going to be corn. And if you don't want corn, then don't plant it in the first place. We we're all terribly upset about the war in Vietnam. What can we do to end it? What can we do to change it? Answer, nothing. You can't go back in time and undo the stupid things that led to it in the first place. What you have to do is learn from it and decide what, first of all, find out what caused it. Then if you don't want it to happen again, don't set those causes in motion again. You, me, and everybody else who set them in motion, or allowed them to be set in motion. We have the kind of government that we put into office, either by voting or by not voting. 
Once you realize this law of cause and effect, you can take charge of your life, your practice, everything. It's your world. If you're happy with the world just the way it is, then don't change it. Leave the setting of causes in motion to those who've been doing it all along. They've been doing a beautiful job, if you like the world the way it is. And if you don't like the world the way it is, then what are you going to do? Set new causes in motion. Who? Me? Yes, me. You. Us. Who else is going to do it? I mean, we made this world the way it is, either by our action or by our inaction. I hear chiropractors say, I'm not getting involved in politics. That's so dirty anyway. Sure, so we get out and we leave politics to all the dirty guys. And then we wonder why politics is dirty. Inaction sets causes in motion just as much as action. So you decide what you want. Well, all of that was our prior discussion. That was just kind of winding it up. Let's look at another universal law or a series of laws, the laws that govern the way matter behaves. Every element, by its chemical composition, by the arrangement of the electrons in the outer shell of the atom, has certain built-in properties. You know what's fantastic about this is that long before science understood it, long before Enrico Fermi and Albert Einstein got their Nobel Prizes for saying this, some fish peddler from Iowa set it down as a principle. He said there is a universal intelligence in all matter, constantly giving to that matter all of its properties and all of its activities, thus maintaining it in existence. Now, he didn't set that up by science. He set it up by common sense. Nevertheless, what he set forth turned out to be true, that all matter behaves in certain ways according to the makeup of the chemistry of that substance. Now, science learns from this. Science, by the way, is the accumulation of information. That's all science is, the accumulation and categorization of knowledge, systematized knowledge. That's what science is. I just read a book today whose only purpose for existing was to prove that chiropractic is a science. And he made some very good rationales, none of which made any sense to me because I looked through them. I knew going in that chiropractic is not a science and never can be. Sci chiropractic can no more be a science than surgery can be a science. Are well, you saying chiropractic is unscientific? No, I'm not saying that at all. The study of chiropractic is a science. The practice of, a, of chiropractic is an art. Why do we have to have this science label anyway? It seems like it's a stamp of approval, a stamp of integrity. Oh, I'm a scientist. That's not a terribly good thing to be, not when you're dealing with life, because all scientists dealing with life fail miserably. Remember, science depends upon inductive reasoning, quantification of that which can be quantified, the substance of the body, the matter. Life, as we've already seen, is not just material. There are immaterial factors to be considered which are not measurable cannot be quantified and therefore must be discounted from the records of science. You'll never understand life or health if you deal only in science. You have to get into the world of the intangible, the philosophical, which is exactly what we've done. But science at least can categorize knowledge about substances so that when architects wish to build a building, they can set forth the materials to be used and they wouldn't try making windows of brick or steel because brick or steel don't have the qualities of being particularly transparent or translucent. Neither would you make the building of glass, which is both transparent and translucent, but not terribly strong. So if you're an architect, you'll use all of your knowledge about steel and concrete and wood and glass, and you'll make a building that will do exactly what you intended it to do by using the laws of cause and effect coupled with your knowledge of the properties of matter. Every substance, every element and every compound has its own peculiar properties different from the properties of every other element and every other compound. That's why we make compounds. That's why we make alloys to take some of the properties of this and some of the properties of that and combine them together to do the job that we educatedly want them to do. Now, the innate intelligence that runs your body also happens to be the architect that built your body. 
it uses, for example, nerve tissue to conduct nerve impulses. Forgetting the labels that we stuck on, calling it nerve, innate intelligence didn't know it was called nerve. It said it, we will use this highly conductive compound to transmit electrical impulses. Why? Because this highly conductive compound is very good at conducting electrical impulses. And that other compound we use for lifting weights. We'll call that muscle. Or you and I will call it muscle. Innate intelligence doesn't call it anything. But this innate intelligence is not only an architect, but is also a builder. It takes in, from the very beginning, raw substances. Material obtained from the outside world. Ham and cheese sandwiches, peanut butter and jelly, milk, mashed apples and strained carrots in the very young. From this, the architect breaks the substances down into their chemical elements, into their basis, reassembles them into new compounds and new alloys, and builds heart, spleen, kidney, liver, hair, fingernails. And the fingernails are not made of kidney tissue, and the kidney is not made of fingernail tissue. The innate intelligence, just remember, innate's last name is intelligence. But even all the intelligence in the world can't make matter do what that matter cannot do. The property has preordained, or rather the matter has preordained properties. Ordained by the nature of the substance, by the number of electrons in the outer ring of the atom, by the construction of the atom. And the innate intelligence can only work with what is available. You can't eat cardboard and expect the body to convert that into brain and spleen and blood and heart cells. The body is built out of the nutrients that it takes in, provided it can make the right chemicals to convert those nutrients into walking, talking, thinking, flesh and blood. See, one of the things that chiropractors sometimes forget while they're pushing vitamins and minerals and nutrients into the human body is that all of those nutrients are totally worthless unless and until the innate intelligence can make the chemicals to convert them into the body's substance. And the body can't make its chemicals terribly well in the right quantity and the right quality when the organs that make the chemicals and the glands that make the chemicals are not perfectly in harmony under the control of the innate intelligence. What I'm saying is that vertebral subluxation stops you from utilizing food substances properly. It stops you from being all that you could be. This is why I get so frustrated when I see chiropractors treating backaches, when they should be dealing with the substance of life. The innate intelligence can only reorganize matter into the living substance of the body when it is free to do so. And even when it is free to do so, it is still limited by the matter that it has to work with. We don't understand this innate intelligence. We know that it's there. Why is it that when you chop off an arm, I said we're going to take questions later on, why is it if you could chop off an arm, the body can't grow a new one? I mean, it grew this one in the first place. An arm surely is important. If a heart is failing, it's injured. It can't survive. Why doesn't the innate intelligence make another one? I mean, you can destroy two-thirds of the liver and the innate intelligence will rebuild it. Why can't it do the same thing with the heart or the eye? And I don't know the answers to these questions. I just know that the body can do what it can do and it can't do what it can't. It is not unlimited. It is limited by the laws of the universe, most of which are unknown to me. But it is limited by the properties of matter. All matter has certain qualifications, certain qualities, certain properties, and the innate intelligence has to work within the framework of those properties. Sometimes it would be great if you had glass in the back of your head so you could see what was behind you. Well, it's easy to see why the innate intelligence didn't do that. The glass in the back of the head would be a very dangerous thing. It's a little too brittle. Besides, people could look in and see there's nobody at home. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand what the limitations of the innate intelligence are, but there are limitations. Not in the intelligence. Remember when we talked about the perfection of the triune of life? We said the innate intelligence is always 100% perfect, 100% of the time. It's not capable of being measured. 
It has no limitations that one can impose upon it, except that it can only express itself through matter, and matter is limited. Sometimes practicing chiropractors get a little frustrated when they expect a certain patient to recover and the patient doesn't. And we say, why not? I think I did everything right. And all too often we start blaming ourselves and changing our technique. You know, there's only one criterion for changing your technique. We've got to have a criterion for determining the presence or absence of vertebral subluxation. And stop measuring these damn symptoms and say to ourselves, hey, if the symptoms haven't gone away, we better change our technique. Let me set up a hypothesis for you. Somebody suffers a vertebral subluxation. 10, 15, or 20 years go by with a nerve tissue suffering accumulated damage. Damage accumulates. Sometimes some of that nerve tissue will become scarred. And eventually, after years of this, some kind of symptoms begin to show up. Maybe they're back aches, maybe they're liver symptoms, who knows what they are. The patient now visits a chiropractor with symptoms. The chiropractor checks, locates, and identifies vertebral subluxation, puts in the correct force in the right place at the right time, whereby the innate intelligence converts that force into an adjustment. The bone is now back exactly where it belongs. But the nerve tissue is still damaged. Maybe permanently. Maybe it'll only remain damaged for another 10 years. Maybe only for another 10 minutes. When should the patient get well? When should the chiropractor stop doing anything to that vertebra? The moment it's back where it belongs. We've got to have better criteria for determining when and where to adjust than whether the patient's getting better or not. And yet almost every technique employed in chiropractic is based upon inductive reasoning to determine the presence or absence of vertebral subluxation. What happened to chiropractic philosophy and its deductive reasoning if we're to fall back on the so-called scientific method? Didn't chiropractic develop because the scientific method is not good enough in dealing with living things? And yet we're going to measure vertebrae and see if they're in the middle or off to the side? We're going to have to talk very seriously either in this session or the next one or the one after about criteria for determining the presence or absence of vertebral subluxation. It just might be the most critical point facing the chiropractic profession today or in any other day. One thing is absolutely certain. The presence or absence of symptoms does not indicate the presence or absence of vertebral subluxation. Long after the subluxation is gone, the nerve tissue may be damaged unable to properly carry an impulse so that all the pattern work is going to reveal a lack of adaptation. That's what pattern work is about, to reveal a lack of adaptation. If the nerve is damaged, the body is not going to adapt properly. Your pattern reading will indicate nerve interference. There will be nerve interference, but no vertebral subluxation. The bone is back where it belongs. Now, if we just leave it there for another year or two years, maybe the scar tissue will heal over, be replaced, maybe Normalcy will return. Maybe it'll never return. But there's no point in keep moving the vertebra around once it's back in its perfect position. Let's recognize that our job must con consist of and be restricted to working with the body for the correction of vertebral subluxation. After all, that's what chiropractic is. Getting sick people well is the commitment of the medical profession. And they're much better equipped than you and I are to do it. At least if their method fails, they can try another one. And their measurement of getting sick people well is very easy. When the symptoms go away, they say the person is well. So all they've got to do is find some chemical or some technique or some physical medicine or some surgery that will get rid of the symptoms. You know, if a person comes in with gallstones, well, they cut out the gallbladder. And the symptoms of gallstones have gone permanently. That person is cured. Because they'll never be whole again. Remember the word healthy comes from the same Greek root as whole. Hail means whole, and that means healthy. And once you've cut out a part, they're not whole again. They'll never be healthy again. But their symptoms will be gone. If the name of the game is to get rid of symptoms, no straight chiropractor has a chance at all, compared with a broad scope practitioner, or a mixer as some people like to call them who can use all of the tools of the straight chiropractor, and if that doesn't get rid of the symptoms, can try a few other things as well. 
little diathermy, ultrasound, shake and bake, stretching machines. I mean, some of those things are going to work some of the time. They do work. And that means that if we measure by symptoms, the mixer chiropractor is going to be more successful than the straight chiropractor on a lot of cases. If the straight chiropractor is to be successful, he or she must change the objective. If your objective in practice is to get sick people well, you're going to fail most of the time anyway, because you have no criteria for measuring whether people are sick or well. The criterion that is generally used is symptoms. That's what medicine uses. Let's talk about symptoms for a moment. The general supposition among the public and subscribed to by, quote, science, meaning medical practice, is that the presence of symptoms means you're sick. And the absence of symptoms means you're healthy. So we walk around asking people, hi, how are you? And they say, fine, and then two days later, they drop dead. <laughs> people walk into chiropractor's offices, and the chiropractor say, how are you today? You know, this happens in the MD's office. You just follow yourself in the typical medical doctor's office. The first part of the game is called diagnosis, which is merely putting a Latin name on what the person tells you. You walk in, you say, Doctor, I have this terrible inflammation inside my mouth. And you say, let me take a look. Uh -huh. Stick out your tongue, say, ah, yes, I'm afraid you have stomatitis. Oh my God, what's that? Well, that's inflammation in the mouth in Latin. <laughs> now, tell me if this isn't typical of any visit to the doctor for any condition. Take these pills or fill this prescription, come see me in a week. You come back in a week, is it any better? If it's better, we're doing the right thing. If it's not better, let's change the prescription. And this, I mean, we're sitting giggling at this. It's exactly what a lot of chiropractors do. Well, we'll try this technique. And if you don't feel better, we'll try that technique. And if enough people feel better or don't feel better, we'll change our whole technique in the practice. We've got to have a valid criterion. The poor MD who masquerades the science, let, let's just follow this thing through. You know, science is predictable. It is duplicable. That's why chemistry is a science. We talked before about giving five different people aspirin. You never know what the results are going to be. One could get rid of the headaches, the other could kill over and drop dead. One could get intestinal bleeding, one gets double vision. It's a trial and error guessing game. Why? If chemistry is a science, why isn't the putting of chemicals in the body scientific? Because every human being is different from every other, and there's no way of predicting what the action of that drug will be on that individual at that moment. Whatever drug you give today has this effect, and tomorrow you give the same drug to a different person. It's the same person, but they've changed. Their chemistry was changed by the first dose of the drug as well as by a lot of other things. The passage of time changes their chemistry. Don't tell me you have the same moods and attitudes, the same internal chemistry today as you had yesterday. Your appetites vary from day to day, your ability to sleep varies, your sense of humor varies, your moods vary, your concentration varies, your physical skills vary, your ability to digest foods varies. We're so constantly changing, there can be no science in the putting of chemicals in the human body. It's guesswork, it is trial and error. And exactly the same must be true of anything physical we do to the body. Getting rid of symptoms cannot be the name of the game in chiropractic. Surely the idea of chiropractic is to keep the nerve channels open and free, not to deal with symptoms. Let's not pretend that the presence of symptoms means that you're sick. Sometimes the body goes through changes which we label symptom, in order to adapt to the environment. What is life? A process of reorganizing your physiology so that you can adapt to the environment. That's how you stay alive. Things which adapt stay alive. Adapting is changing your physiology. When it is necessary for the body to detoxify, to get rid of toxins or poisons, it very often does that by a process called oxidation. Oxidation takes place better and faster in the presence of heat. Heat is a catalyst. All the chemists know that. But the innate intelligence knew it long, be long before there was a discipline called chemistry. The innate intelligence knows that in order to oxidize poisons, it is sometimes necessary to elevate the temperature. And every chiropractor has had experiences with a little child brought in at a temperature of 101. 
you check the spine, the kid is subluxated as all hell, you do what you have to do, subluxation is gone, and mother says, wonderful, now the temperature will come down, right? Wrong. Now it goes up to 103. Did you make the kid sick? The presence of symptoms doesn't mean that he's sick. The presence of symptoms means, one, that the body is going through change. Now, the next question is, is it good change or bad change? Well, unfortunately, we don't know the answer to that. We can only guess. And we'll leave that to the science of medicine, that guessing game. Well, doesn't there come a time when elevated temperature is dangerous? When it can actually cause convulsions, brain damage, death? Yes, that's been demonstrated. Unfortunately, nobody knows when that time is. And certainly, medicine is extremely conservative. There's one law that regulates the practice of medical doctors. And that is that if you do nothing, you could be charged with neglect. If you do something radical, you can charge, be charged with being a radical. If you do what every other physician in similar circumstances would have done, then you've done everything possible, even though the patient dies from what you did. <laughs> now, that sounds harsh, but it in fact regulates the day-to-day -day practice of medicine. Every physician knows that if he or she does in practice exactly what every other physician would do, they will be held blameless regardless of the result. Let's stop for a few minutes and talk about this monstrosity called malpractice and malpractice insurance because it intimidates every practitioner of the healing arts and it causes a great deal of bad practice. Not malpractice, bad practice. Although they should be the same, shouldn't they? Bad practice is doing what's best to protect your own ass, never mind the patient. That's bad practice. But sometimes, because you don't know what's best for that patient, sometimes, for the sake of the patient, it might be necessary to do those things. And if you do something that another physician would not have done, and it turns out badly, if it turns out well, you have no problem. But if it turns out badly, you have malpracticed because you did something differently from standard procedure. You've either done what some other physician would not have done, or you failed to do what every other physician would do. These are the bases of malpractice suits. If you have not deviated from standard procedure, even though that standard procedure has proved fatal in every single case without exception, if you deviate from that practice, then you will be held legally responsible for any bad results even though the good results are the patient dying. <laughs> Deviate from what is standard and you're held responsible. So every physician knows this and they know, look, if the kid's running 102 and I ignore it, 99 chances out of 100, there'll be no problem. Take two aspirin and call me in the morning. If, on the other hand, one of those who goes in the com this is one of those who goes into convulsion and dies, then I will be found guilty of neglect. I neglected my patient. Maybe for safety's sake, just in case, we'll put the kid in the hospital. When I was going to Palmer College, uh, I dated a lady. Like most uh, Palmer students, we didn't have money to go out on dates. So we'd sit home and play hearts. We'd sit around eating popcorn and drinking Kool-Aid, the only things we could afford, and playing hearts. <laughs> We're sitting there playing hearts one night, and my lady is here, you remember, huh? my, my lady is sitting next to me, and I said, it's your turn, and she's fast asleep. Fast asleep. It's the first time she got a spine check that day. I, uh, here was I, um, new in the student clinic, and she was my first patient. I checked her spine, adjusted, and she fell asleep right in the middle of the card game. So this tiredness and falling asleep is a very common adjustment reaction. Another one is thirst. People say, Boy, I, don't, I don't know what you did. I couldn't stop drinking. I, you know, you don't have to tell people to drink eight to ten glasses of water a day. That's a wrong number to start with. And much more important, their body knows what they should eat or drink during the day. So that's another typical adjustment reaction. Sometimes the reverse happens, especially with kids. The parents will say, for God's sake, turn him down. Can't control it. That'll, if, he, if he's going to be like this after every time he comes here, I'm just going to have to stop bringing him. Uh, fortunately, that kind of thing doesn't go on forever, and they kind of level out at a higher energy level than they were before. All right, so that's our adjustment reaction. 
The next thing we have to talk about in the onset of new symptoms is a very well-known but rarely seen chiropractic phenomenon called retracing. Now let's understand, you're very seldom going to see somebody going through retracing symptoms and it's a fabulous cop-out for chiropractors who don't understand philosophy at all and want to pretend to the patients they understand why they suddenly went through some changes and got sick. Oh, you're retracing. Uh, in order to go from the top of the hill all the way down to the bottom, let's say your house is at the top of the hill, you have to leave your house and you go past the phone booth and two light poles and then the greenhouse and the red house and the cemetery. And you walk all the way down past those things. To get back up to the top of the hill, to go home again, you have to go past the cemetery and the greenhouse and the red house and the this and the, all the things you passed, you have to pass in reverse order. That's what retracing is all about. It's a revisitation of those old landmarks. As you left total health to go downhill in sickness and disease, long before chiropractic, you passed certain milestones. On the way back, you have to go through those same milestones. Now, most of the time, you're going to go back through them quickly, smoothly, and not even notice them. Every once in a while, however, you will pause at one of those milestones, and the person will observe that particular phenomenon. Some have tried to explain it as being a mental factor, that in getting sick, you establish certain memory pathways in your brain certain physiological changes in the substance of the brain. And as you go back to health, you go over those pathways again, and that causes a visitation of symptoms, but they are perhaps psychosomatic. In some cases, maybe they are, who knows? I prefer a more simple physiological explanation because it's easier for me to understand, though it's not necessarily more true. I would suggest that retracing probably could be explained many different ways, each of them uh, one contributory factor. The way I like to talk about it is to talk about trying to cultivate bacteria. Now, anybody who's worked in the lab knows that cultivating bacteria in a laboratory is not quite as easy as it sounds. Everything must be done perfectly. First of all, you must have the right medium. Without that, the bacteria won't survive. You must have the right temperature, the right humidity, the right pH. Everything must be right, then you can raise a colony of bacteria. And of course, the same is true in the body. In fact, the environment in the body is not particularly good for bacteria to cultivate and grow. One of the areas that's particularly bad is the area around the kidney. The kidney has an average pH, I believe, of about 5.8, which is much too acid for most types of bacteria. But supposing you become subluxated, your body chemistry begins to change. Let's say the pH at the kidney doesn't stay at 5.8. It becomes a little less acid. It becomes 5.9, 6.0, 6.1. Somewhere along the way there, it is sufficiently alkali or less acid that bacteria can grow there and be cultivated, and you get ki kidney infection because you've set up a perfect environment for kidney to grow. Now, what do you do when you get a kidney, kidney infection? Well, everybody shoots up with penicillin. Now, it kills all the bacteria, takes away the symptoms, and you're free to go on down the, toward the cemetery, symptom-free. Except because the pH is still, six, uh, still around 6, 6, 1, 6, 2, whatever it is, you get another kidney infection. And people who get kidney infections always seem to get another one, and the MDs always blame it on the bacteria, in which case, why the hell is it always the left kidney? You think they're all left-handed bacteria? <laughs> Have you noticed that people who get these infections get them again and again in the same place? And say, oh, the bacteria keep coming back. Why do they keep coming back to that one kidney? Because that's the one that's the perfect environment for the development of the bacterial colony. And they shoot them up with penicillin again, and again it works. And it happens a third time, and after a while, maybe after three infections, now there are no more. Now that area has become so alkali that the bacteria can't survive. Now they're so sick, even the bacteria can't live in them. <laughs> Eventually, they're going to come down with acute glomerulonephritis or some other kidney disease, but they never have any more bacteria until you come along 
And what do you do? You help the body to rebalance its chemistry. You help that pH of the kidney to go from 6.2, where it is when you interfere, back to 5.8, where it belongs. The only trouble is, to get from 6.2 to 5.8, it has to go through 6.1, 6.0, 5.9, and all the points in between. During those times, what do you think could happen? You're damn right. They could get another kidney infection. I haven't had one of those in 12 years. You made me sick. That would be a classic retracing example. Not adjustment reaction. Adjustment reaction happens immediately after the first visit. Retracing could happen after months or even years of chiropractic as their body slowly rechanges its, uh, its physiology, reorganizes its physiology from its sickest level when they first came to see you back towards its most normal level. Now, it may never get all the way back to where it should. The body can only heal as far as the body can heal. It may never get all the way to 5.8. Hey, suppose they get stuck at 6.0. Then they're always going to have kidney infections again. Not your fault. You didn't make them sick. If you want to get rid of the kidney infections, suboxate them again. Throw them back to 6.2. No more infections. Sure, they'll die of glomerulonephritis 10 years down the line, but at least they won't have any infections. You cannot be responsible for the state of a patient's health. The only thing you can be responsible for is their state of vertebral subluxation or lack of. That's all we're in business for, is to keep those life channels open. So retracing, then, is another phenomenon. Well, the question often comes up is, well, should you warn the patients about this? Should you tell them about retracing? My feeling is no. And the reason I say that is, People can be so suggestive that if you warn them that something like that could happen, half of them are going to go home and develop it out of fear that it'll happen. Well, I better get those infections again. And they'll go home, and sure enough, they get the infections <laughs> here. People are suggestive. Yet, you remember in chiropractic college, every time you dis discuss a disease, there's one guy who always came down with it. Got so bad that they would discuss syphilis, he wouldn't even come to class. <laughs> <laughs> but people can be suggestive. And I personally feel I don't want to talk to them about retracing because it is such a rare thing. Furthermore, if they ever get a retracing symptom, I may recognize the symptom, or they might, but I wouldn't know whether it's retracing or totally separate. That's the trouble with retracing. Fortunately, most people don't experience the symptoms of it. They all go through the levels. The vast majority uh, have no knowledge, no recurrence of actual symptoms. I've had, when I've explained this retracing, chiropractors have asked me, well, supposing the person has had a heart attack, does that mean on the way back to health they're going to have another heart attack? No, a heart attack is not a disease. It's a result of. That's an event resulting from a gradual disease process. Yeah, but what about these people who get a heart attack who've never been sick before? Oh, they've been sick all right. They just didn't know it. The purpose of the innate intelligence is life. 100% life, 100% health. That's what it's working for constantly. There is never a circumstance in which the innate intelligence will harm the structures through which it expresses. Never will the innate intelligence on the path back to health and life cause disease. It may allow symptoms to develop, but that's very different from causing disease. I was asked by a student that one of the chiropractic colleges a couple of years ago. Well, when you open up those life channels, you let all that energy flow through. Supposing a person has had the nerve energy to the heart partially choked off for years, getting worse and worse and worse, and it's adapted gradually and slowly over the years. Now, after 15 years of getting by under this depleted energy, you come along, you open the channels, you send through a surge of energy. Can that kill the person? Blow out the valves, cause a heart attack, all that energy coming through at once? Answer? When you open up the channels, you're not shooting a charge of energy through there. What you're doing is restoring control to the innate intelligence. You're allowing the innate intelligence to create as many mental impulses for that body part as are needed by that body part. This is not a constant flow of impulses. Innate's last name is intelligence. It intelligently creates mental impulses, from what does it make these innate forces? 
it makes them from universal forces by adapting them for use within the body. And it will send through just as many impulses at whatever strength the body can most perfectly use. The whole idea of chiropractic is to trust the innate intelligence to know what it's doing. That's what our deductive reasoning is all about. We say that all the inductive minds, all the knowledge of all the scientists in the world put together, don't know a damn thing about your body or mine individually. We know about all bodies, but know nothing about mine. We could measure, if science was so inclined, could measure how many voltages or how many amperes or whatever it is of electricity a 200 pound man would send from brain to all parts of the body in a 24 hour period. They could measure that. They measure it in 10,000 people and take the average. And that doesn't say one thing about what impulses my heart needs at this moment. That knowledge is known only to the innate intelligence. Using the brain as a computer and also using the brain as the generator of electricity or the transformer of electricity, the innate intelligence will send to the heart exactly the right quantity and quality of energy that it needs at any given moment and will never under any circumstances harm the structures within which it works. Retracing, though it may give the evidence of a recurrence of a disease, is in fact a step on the road back to health. All right, last one. The last thing that is going to cause symptoms to appear, new symptoms in a patient. We don't like to talk about it. We much rather pretend it doesn't happen, but it does happen. And it's called technique trauma. Let's understand, first of all, that no v adjustment ever under any circumstances could cause harm. It is absolutely impossible for an adjustment to cause harm. Adjustment, by definition, is the action of the innate intelligence using its own muscles to correct a vertebral subluxation, thus opening up nerve channels. That can never be damaging. However, the technique employed could be damaging. I remember once having a woman brought to my office by an obstetrician who had tried a lumbar roll on her spine. She was in her early in her ninth month of pregnancy. And she was complaining of backaches. And I asked him, should I go to the chiropractor? This is the obstetrician up on the other corner. Should I go to the chiropractor? And he said, no, I can do it. He does. I can do it better. I'm an MD. So he put her on the table and tried to give her a lumbar roll up on his examining table. Result, she couldn't get off the table. And he had some assistants carry her out of his office into his car and bring her down into my office to try and undo the damage that he'd done. It's very easy to do damage with sloppy technique. We've been hearing some complaints lodged against chiropractors by the medical profession recently saying that chiropractic can cause tearing of the cervical arteries. Nonsense. Chiropractic can cause that. I guess some chiropractors could. Some techniques possibly could. Let's talk a little bit about technique trauma. Remember, the perfect technique must be that technique which offers the body the least amount of energy that it needs to convert into an adjustment. You make it the least amount by accurate positioning. The more accurate your positioning, the more accurate your line of drive, the more accurate your analysis, in other words, the more you can reduce your force to absolute minimum. Let's learn one thing from our medical friends. In the oath of Hippocrates, the, the credo of medical practice, first, cause no harm. Now, they don't do it, but damn it, we should. First responsibility of a chiropractor should be to cause no harm. Not every vertebral subluxation is going to respond to your technique, to my technique, or perhaps to any technique. But at least let's make sure we don't do any harm. Let us never put enough force into a spine to do damage. You hear about fractured ribs and collapsing vertebrae and radiation of thousands of people, so you find any who have osteoporosis. Good technique 
should be totally, absolutely safe. I tell my students, you treat every human being who walks into that office as though they're 93 years old and have osteoporosis in every vertebra. You should have a technique so gentle that it could not possibly cause damage in anybody. And if your technique is not that gentle and not that good, maybe we should spend more time learning chiropractic and a damn sight less time learning medical diagnosis, vitamin therapy, and a whole bunch of other things. Our first responsibility as chiropractors must be to have a technique which is safe, first of all, and second, effective. We have to develop criteria for determining when and where to introduce our force. And then reduce the force to its absolute irreducible minimum. And that means total relaxation and acceptance of the patient. Remember, people who come into your office are not coming to you as the first human being who's had contact with their health or their body. They were raised with dentists and physicians and vaccinations and nurses, they've been probed and pushed at and shoved on and hurt. This will only just sting for a second, liar. Wham, in goes the needle. Huh? The arm is sore for five days. We have been lied to by the medical profession so much that we've become gun shy. And all of the public who come to you have been that route. And they get on your table, they have no idea of what to expect. First of all, just put yourself in their shoes, getting on this bloody great table that then goes down, and there's all this machinery and equipment around, and there's 240 pounds, six foot four chiropractor, and all your friends have said, he's not going to hurt you, right? I'm not quite sure you're ready to relax as much as you should. A patient who is not relaxed will take your gentle force and put a massive thrust against it. And the chiropractor says, oh, you're fighting me. I'll do it a little harder. We try and go faster and we finish up going harder. This is counterproductive. Every negative experience they have with you, you know, if you put in your little gentle force and it wasn't enough, don't get greedy. Maybe it was enough for that day. You know, say, oh, shit, I missed, and go back and do it again. <laughs> and don't yell at the patient, it's your fault, it didn't relax. And don't ever, under any circumstances, use these ripping moves that put forces into several vertebrae at the same time. If you put forces into several vertebrae at the same time, which one is going to move? Oh, that's easy. The most freely movable, meaning the one that's not subluxated. You can make all kinds of pretty ripping sounds, and still the subluxation is there. But first, you've got to have a criterion for determining the presence or absence of subluxation. Then you've got to have a technique which is gentle, but still effective. Next week, or the week after, we're going to talk a whole lot more about technique. But to avoid technique trauma, let's do certain things. One, please, never, never, never thrust against resistance. If the person is resisting, back off and then try another time when they're a little more relaxed. And uh, pretty soon, if you keep doing that, if you keep refusing to put forces in there against resistance, pretty soon they're going to realize you're not going to hurt them, and they'll let that resistance go. And then don't punish them by jumping on them with both feet. <laughs> you see? When they let go, you're going to find that that tiny little bit of force that you were using was enough anyway. If it's accurately placed, hey, if you're inaccurate in your analysis, or your use of leverage, if you don't understand the laws of physics, or you use general racking, twisting moves, then you're going to have to use a whole lot more force. But if you can reduce the force to its minimum by selecting exactly the point where the body can utilize it, that takes very little force at all, provided you know what you're doing. If you have no idea what you're doing, then if your only goal in life is to make things go snap, crackle, pop, then of course you're going to get technique traumas. And the only thing I can suggest then is if you do have somebody with a technique trauma, and really you shouldn't ever get, the only time you should get a technique trauma is if the person is totally relaxed and then they, they fool you on the timing. And just as you make your tiny little thrust, they buck or pull the other way, and it's their force that will cause the trauma, not yours. That can happen, but boy, it's not going to happen very often. If your technique is gentle enough, they're going to learn to accept that, and they won't resist it nearly as much as if you use abrupt 
violent moves. I don't think there should ever be a move used that does not stabilize the rest of the spine. All parts of the spine should be stabilized except the one signal, single segment in which you're trying to put your force. If you put the force into two or three, then obviously you've got to use a lot more force. I guess pretty soon we're going to have to talk a little bit more about this analytical procedure that we talked about, letting the body's own muscles tell you exactly the location and the direction by which the innate intelligence will move that vertebra, use its muscles to make the adjustment. Well, if you can duplicate that, it barely takes a touch. Remember, you're not trying to push a vertebra. When your car gets stuck in the snow and ice, you don't try and push that 10-ton truck, do you? Well, I do. I get my shoulder behind it. Yes, but the truck has its own engine. You ever try and push a truck when its engine is not running? No, what you do when your car is stuck in the snow and ice, you have somebody behind the wheel supplying a little gas, and what you're doing is giving a little gentle direction to help it with traction. You give it a little direction. The engine of the car pulls it. That's what the adjustment is all about. You're giving a little direction. The engine of the bone, the muscle attached to it, supplies the motive power and actually makes the adjustment. You should never be using enough force to move a vertebra. Only enough force so that added to the internal force the body's already generating, the two together can become an adjustment. And boy, if you do that, your technique trauma is almost zero. The only time it's going to happen anyway, a technique trauma, is when the patient fools you and pulls his head or his body out of the way, and usually it's the head and neck that'll do it, or if you allow yourself to get distracted. You know, that split second when you're coming through with your thrust, you know, somebody's talking to you, or you're worrying about the patient who just left. In most chiropractor's offices, I mean, aside from all the bullshit time and the phony time, the real time that you're spending in technique can be measured in seconds. Certainly the adjusting thrust itself is in seconds, split seconds. Perhaps on the table, actually doing your technique, you're about a minute and a half. Maybe your analysis takes a little longer depending on the analytical procedure you use. You're not with that patient very long. I don't know how much an hour you get paid for your time. But I do know that the very least those patients can expect of you during that time for which you're so highly paid is your total concentration. When Mrs. Jones gets off the table, you must forget her spine, her problems, and concentrate on Mr. Smith, who is now on the table. Total concentration without interruption is absolutely essential to the avoidance of technique trauma. Concentrating on what is that body telling you? You've got to tune into a human being's body and know when they're ready to receive and convert a thrust. BJ improperly described it as innate to innate contact. Improperly because he's, to he's talking about innate intelligence and it's really your trained, educated mind that's doing the job. It's intuitive, just like somebody doing fast typing. That's not innate. They learned it. They do it often enough, it becomes intuitive. You don't think and concentrate on which muscle is doing what, but you just let that person's body, that person's muscles take over and inform your muscles, and somehow you, you establish a rapport between their physical presence, their energy level, and your physical presence and your energy level, and you don't even know when that thrust is coming through. If you're concentrating... If you're worrying about what the kid's doing with your Buick or what's for dinner tonight, then there's no way you can concentrate. But if you will let yourself become totally attuned to that patient's body, sublimate yourself to the needs of that patient, it's almost as though your hands have a life of their own and they'll just do what is necessary. And I've had students ask me, why did you do it that way on that person? And I've honestly not been able to answer. I, I just don't, it just felt right. And you know, for me, that's a good enough answer. It felt right. Students I've, I've seen watch and memorize and try and duplicate positions, and they bend their hand this way, and is my elbow high enough? And as long as you're thinking about it, you can never do it right. You've got to feel it. Shut off the mind and open up the, these other channels, whatever they are. You've already learned. It couldn't work that way if you hadn't learned the, with the mind first. The typist couldn't do touch typing 80 words a minute without first learning it. You can't just sit down with a typewriter and innate will take over and tell you where the keys are. Innate doesn't know where the keys are. Innate doesn't care where the keys are. But once you have learned it and you're doing it every day, 
and most particularly, you become a better chiropractor for that particular patient the more times you work in that person's spine. When a person first comes to me, I'm tempted to do very little on them the first day because I don't know anything about them. Later on, I know their moods and their compression. They know my touch. We can work together. And the more we work together, the better we become as a team. I think that chiropractic is not something you do to somebody's body. It's something that they and you share to transfer an educatedly derived and refined universal force for the availability of their innate intelligence to convert into an adjustment. That's the best way I can describe it. And only when it's done on that level, that conscious tuning in, sublimating yourself to another human being, only then are you going to be totally free from the dangers of technique trauma. Then, if they ever do get the idea to buck or tense up or something happens, they'll communicate that to you in time to stop your thrust from going in anyway. Please tell your CAs, if anybody, you know, when technique trauma happens, very often the patient doesn't say anything to you, they don't want to hurt your feeling. Your feelings, they're going to go out and they may say something in the waiting room, which is great for your practice. You know, he was a little rough today. Huh? That's all you need. Now somebody comes to him in the afternoon and says, hey, you want to go bowling? No, I can't. I went to the chiropractor today. I have a headache. Mm -hmm. huh? Not very good for you or for chiropractic. Please have your CAs understand that if they catch any sign of anything like that in the reception room, they should just have the patient sit down and wait a minute and you'll check them again. Sometimes just resting your hands, checking the neck, reassuring them that they are not subluxated may be all they need. Maybe, I don't know, maybe a force wasn't properly used and they are still subluxated. Maybe they just need to rest for 10 minutes and they'll clear it out. Whatever it is, if you hear any part of it, give them the opportunity to know that you care. It is important that you care about your patients. Unfortunately, it's also important that you let them know that you care. Not by your words, but by what you do. Let's make a point of doing everything we possibly can to reduce technique trauma to the irreducible minimum. Thank you.